irreverent, entertaining, cool. You're listening to LA Talk Radio. You're listening to Get Yourself the Job with Jennifer Hill, only on LA Talk Radio. Well, happy Monday, everybody, and thank you so much for tuning in again to Get Yourself the Job with Jennifer Hill. Today, I am delighted to have a dear friend and respected colleague and mentor of mine, Paul Falcon, on the phone. Paul is an experienced human resources executive who's in the San Diego area, and throughout his career, he has held senior level positions with companies such as Nickelodeon, Paramount Pictures, and Time Warner. In fact, he's a former contingency recruiter and also worked in private equity where he placed C-level candidates such as CEOs, CFOs, and COOs for newly acquired portfolio companies. He's a long-term contributor to HR Magazine and an instructor in the UCLA Extension of Business and Management as well as a top-rated presenter and lecturer. We've invited Paul to the show today to discuss one of his 10 best-selling books, 96 Great Interview Questions to Ask Before You Hire, which was published by the American Management Association and provides insights into candidate interview and selection from the hiring manager's vantage point. Paul, tell us what we need to know about the secrets of job hunting from the hiring manager's point of view, and give us a behind-the-scenes kind of curtain look to a little bit about you and your career. I think some of our listeners who may not be familiar with your books or may not have had the privilege of hearing you speak would love to know a little bit about you and then kind of your perspective from a human resources and hiring perspective. Oh, sure, Jennifer. I I would be happy to help. Um, It's interesting. I started my career um, in the contingency search field and did that for about six years, and then I moved into corporate human resources. So in that sense, I had worked both sides of the desk. And on the corporate side, I had always hired through fairly senior level jobs, usually VP and above at Fortune 500 kinds of companies. And then at one point, I moved into private equity. And in private equity, I was hiring C-level people for the uh, the newly acquired portfolios that we had. So I've kind of had all sorts. I've done the sales hiring. I've done the administrative, you know, the non-exempt. I've done the IT accounting. I have done all through the through the ranks, all the way up to C level. So, yeah, I've got a, I've got an interesting background. <laughs> you know, at least a lot of it. So. Yeah, it sounds like so you've kind of sat on every side of the desk, and that's a unique perspective specifically for a human resources executive like yourself to have, because you know what it's like to sit on my side of the desk where we're trying to pitch you candidates, and then you know what it's like to be on the hiring manager's side where you have to kind of weed through all these submissions and figure out from your own pile as well as what recruiters are delivering, like who the right candidates are for your job. I think recruiters, whether you're in the search side of the business or in the human resources side, recruiters love the hunt. Um, they like seeing the so project true. from start to finish. Um, and you give them that control and say, okay, this is the challenge that I have, and this is what I need in this particular role. Now go out and find it. And, uh, you know, they're really they're good at that, and they enjoy that. And through their network, they'll, they'll keep pushing. They'll usually whittle, whittle down to three to five candidates that they'll put in front of a hiring manager. And then once they've got it to the top two, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the beauty is in sight. That's the part that they like. And then when they finally get down to the, uh, this is a candidate we're, we're thinking, you know, the hiring manager says this is a candidate we're thinking of hiring, typically recruiters at that point will start checking references and making sure that everything is looking strong and, and, and positive. And then when they finally lock it in, um, they're ready to start another assignment elsewhere. But, but that is the fun. It's the chase. It's the hunt that they enjoy. Yeah, it's a little bit of a different perspective uh, being a recruiter versus being on your end of things because recruiters could work on various requisitions all at the same time versus as you as the hiring manager, you have a need and you can't work on something else until that need gets filled. So tell us leading into that, actually, I mean, about some of your amazing books, such as 96 Great Interview Questions to Ask Before You Hire. Uh, I would love some insight from you as far as what some of the questions are that A, as a hiring manager, somebody could ask and B, kind of what you're looking for and what you're trying to elicit when you ask those sorts of questions to a potential employee. Glad you asked. Well, the the funny thing for me is I don't like to necessarily read a book from page one to page 240 to figure out what the, what the theme was. 
And so most of the books I've always written, Jennifer, would be focused on, you know, quick, I've got an interview with a salesperson. Give me 10 questions I need to ask and tell me what their interpretations are going to be. What's the likelihood that they're going to respond a certain way and how should I follow up with it? And that's kind of how I wrote the book. You know, college campus recruits, millennials, senior executives, administrative assistants, you know, those are really the, the bulk of where the hires tend to happen. And that's kind of the way I like to write. And so depending on what you're trying to do. If you're hiring a salesperson, it's going to be a very, very different interview than if you're hiring someone who's in IT or more analytical. True. So you have to ask different questions and you have to know what to, re- what to expect in the responses. And that to me made the most sense. And the funny thing is, I always say I'm the biggest user of my books because <laughs> I, I don't remember, but you know, seriously, if I'm going into an interview, I kind of pull the book off the shelf and I'm like, okay, I kind of get, I have to get my head around you oh. know, okay, for this particular kind of Paul, hire. hold on one second. We here? actually, we have a caller calling in with a question. Let's go ahead and see if we can add this caller to our call. Can you hold on? Oh, sure. and we lost it. I didn't see it fast enough. <laughs> if you're listening out there, if you call back in, we'll go ahead and add you to the call. Uh, so yeah, so going back to that, that is a great point is that even I know what you're saying from my own perspective, I've coached, I, I wrote my own book three years ago, and you were tremendously helpful in guiding me with that process. And for me, I even forget some of the stuff I wrote, I say, Oh, you know, reference chapter five, you know, on this or that, but it's, it's always helpful to have kind of that, uh, you know, manual, like your book is a tool that every HR person should have at their desk. And certainly job seekers as well, because it's great for them to have as what can I expect to be asked in an interview. And it really will help them to start to formulate the right sort of answers. Because so often, I think job seekers go in blind, and they don't even know what sort of questions to expect. Yeah, the funny thing, Jennifer, was I wrote the book for hiring managers. (laughs) That was the target audience. And I didn't realize a lot of people were going to buy the book who were in job search mode. <laughs> it's almost like an ancillary market, but I think people, you're right, people were thinking, oh, I want to kind of see the handbook. I want to look behind the curtain, and I want to see how the hiring manager is trained so that I can kind of understand the logic between what goes on in the interview and how the decisions are made. So it's so a good point. What have been some uh, of the questions? I mean, clearly there you've written 10 books. In this particular book, there are 96 questions that you like. Of those questions, is there one particular question that you like to ask, irrespective of whatever field or level somebody is at, that you feel shines some insights into what that applicant is about? Oh, absolutely. You know, the funny thing is I... People ask me, so you ask these 96 questions and you're always going to hire a great person. And I'm like, yeah, I wish. But, you know, it doesn't have to be these 96, in fairness. I do think, though, um, the logic is having worked a desk from both sides for most of my career, you kind of get a feel for the patterns in people's responses. So one of the things, even if you're hiring entry level or if you're hiring senior executive or anything in between, there's something that I've always called informed candidacy. In other words, I'm looking mm. for people who are thinking through what they're doing. They're not a cork on a wave. They've really, you know, they, they have a healthy dosage of, of career introspection. Mm. They can articulate what they're looking for. So what I usually do when I open up an interview is I, I try and make it as cordial and conversational as I can, mm-hmm. but I focus on the candidate. So my questions typically focus on, you know, tell me what you are looking for right now. What are the two or three criteria you're using in selecting your next company or your next job? Um, And that gets them talking a little bit. Now, sometimes they're a little nervous because they're (laughs) not used to these questions that are so focused on them. But but to me, it is important. And, And I talk to them about, you know, what would be your next move in career progression if you stayed with your current company? And how long would it take you to get there? And then I'll ask them questions about, you know, still trying to hone in on what they're looking for. It's like, okay, so if you could find the job that you think you'd be interested in, um, how would you explain it to, a, you know, if you took a job with us that you're interviewing for us with today, how would you explain that to a prospective employer five years from now? Um, how would this job um, create a link in your future career progression? I mean, how do you see this being your next stepping stone. Those kinds of questions, at first people shy away a little bit, like, I'm not used to answering questions like this, but the truth of the matter is you're almost taking the employee development paradigm, you know, the training and development piece, which happens after they're hired, of course, and yeah. you're moving it to the front of the, uh, of, the, of the hiring process before they're even hired. You're kind of getting in their head a little bit and trying to figure out what do they see for themselves? Is this a good move? Can they articulate why they want to come here? 
And, you know, where do you go from there and how do you build it from there? And that turns out to be a good interviewing style because people really, really like it. You get thank you notes where they say, <laughs> wow, no one's ever really asked me those kinds of questions before, but they were really neat. And I think that's so important because you have to have trust in the relationship. And the final thought on that, Jennifer, for me is candidates have to be able to make themselves, if you're a good hiring manager, a good recruiter, candidates need to be able to make themselves a little vulnerable. They need to say something like, you know, Jennifer, I normally don't say this on an interview, but <laughs> when, when you get to that person, when you get to that level with the person, you, you hit gold. You, There's trust there. You can make yourself vulnerable on both sides of the desk. That's when I find the interviews make the most sense. So that's interesting because I just had this happen with an applicant recently, and I was taken aback because, of course, on the recruitment side, we want candidates to put their best foot forward, and so we develop them, and we go through, and we role play some of these questions, and I almost fell out of my chair when one of my clients said that he asked a really good question of a job seeker. He said, okay, what would your supervisor say about you? Uh, and fill in the blank. My supervisor would say X about me, and so he said that's not really the question he wants to get to the bottom of. It's the next question once he gets them comfortable and they says and my supervisor will say that I need to work on blank and I, I thought that was really interesting because it kind of gets people comfortable oh my supervisor would say I'm great and then of course the job seeker says oh well uh, my supervisor would say I need to work on attendance and for me as a recruiter hearing that on my end I'm like oh my gosh the interview's <laughs> over <laughs> that's, yeah. that's not going to end not well. probably the best answer but yeah I understand but I it understand. was interesting going back to your point because the interviewer the head of this uh, company thought that was a brilliant answer and actually really respected the way that the follow-up questions went. Well, here's how we would handle this if you were having attendance issues, which we would intend that wouldn't be a problem. First, this would happen, then this. And it really actually warmed the employer up to the candidate because he appreciated her authenticity. So if you were in that capacity and somebody say you're asking these questions where you're giving people a chance to become vulnerable and be authentic with you, do you think that that it would be, does it depend on the way they answer? Is that always going to be a plus sign in your column if somebody answers authentically, even if it is something as wrenching as saying attendance, which is every recruiter's worst nightmare? <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you. If the answer for me would be yes. Now, you ask 10 recruiters, you're going to get 11 answers, right? Because people have different opinions, and sometimes their own opinions change. But the truth of the matter is, there's no such thing as a perfect candidate, and there's no such thing as a perfect job. I've always said what you're looking for, again, I'm giving you the, the answer, Jennifer, on the hiring manager side as opposed to the applicant side, and we can switch that over in just a minute. Okay. But for right now, on the hiring manager side, my argument is you're looking for high probability hires. You're not looking for guarantees. Mm. If you're hiring someone who can come in, and it's a been there, done that, and on their first day, by the time you get to lunch, this person is a fully contributing member <sighs> of the team. You've overhired. Um, oh. You want to have some learning curve in there. If you're making an 80% match, that makes more sense. Really? Now, you know, people are motivated. The glue that binds someone to the company oftentimes is the learning curve. They, they enjoy learning new things. They're oh. helping the company. They're building their resume at the same time. That seems to be the magic balance. That's the equilibrium you want to find throughout someone's career to have long-term employees who make a difference in your organization. On the applicant side, a lot of times applicants overthink this. They have to give the perfect answer. And, of course, if you have an employer who's asking questions that are very structured, question, answer, question, answer. It's almost like a ping pong game, <laughs> but, they're, but they're never going below that level. Yeah. And it's, so the employer doesn't know how to interpret the response because, well, it's a good response. Let me ask another question. And the applicant is trying to be perfect. And what I would say to everybody is, you know, you don't have to be perfect. Don't put so much pressure on yourself. I think so many times so true. candidates go in thinking they have to be a certain mold. They read the things. If there is a typo on your resume, 99% of employers will not <laughs> consider you any further. Well, that's a bunch of baloney. It it's, depends on who you ask. It's on a case-by-case um, -case basis, that's for sure. It's a case-by-case, -case, of course. And you know what? If there's a likability because the applicant feels comfortable and is able to kind of share and make, them, make their personality known, um, the hiring managers are human beings like everyone else. And the truth of the matter is a lot of hiring managers hate interviewing. They're not comfortable. They don't know what questions to ask. They don't so know how to interpret the responses. It's an awkward hour or half hour. And if the applicant can kind of come in and make them comfortable, 
And to, well, Jennifer, would you like me to kind of go into that a little more deeply? You know, those little kinds of comments, let their personality shine. It's okay to make yourself vulnerable. You'll be surprised. I think as a job search strategy, once you're in the door, um, that will go a long way because the likability factor is very, very important. Yeah, so it is about the likability factor. So what would you say for you, if you're meeting somebody, there is that old adage that if you meet somebody within the first 30 seconds to five minutes, depending on who you ask, you've already made an assessment about that person. Would you say that holds true for you as an HR manager, for example, or as a HR executive, if you have a candidate who's coming in the door, irrespective of the answers that they might be giving you or the first words out of their mouth, have you already been swayed one way or another by who they're being? and how they're coming across? And the answer is definitely yes. Okay. Although there's a caveat. There's a <laughs> caveat. I think the first thing is we all tend to hire in our own image. True. And if, if you kind of connect with someone from the first handshake to the eye, you know, the eye contact to the sit down, make yourself comfortable and, you know, that kind of thing, that's great. And that's important. But what I tell employers when I do my little, you know, when I write my articles or my books or whatever, teaching the classes, you know, likability equals compatibility. Don't just fall in love with the likely, you know, the, the like side of it. You have to make sure that you have compatible styles. Some of the questions could be seen around, you know, tell me how many hours uh, you typically work in, in a business week, you know, to get your work done. Um, how do you accept constructive criticism? There's no right or wrong answer here, but do you kind of tend, do you pride yourself on having a tougher hide or should I be a little more careful not to hurt your feelings? You know, you want to kind of get into, I don't want to make it sound too soft, mm -hmm. but the truth of the matter is when you look at what makes a higher work, and this is from my days back working a desk on the search side, usually it was not a technical mismatch that caused the malfunction, so to speak. The employer hires the candidate from the search firm and the, the employer pays the search firm a fee. But if the candidate doesn't work out in the 60 days or 90 days or whatever, um, you know, typically the search firm has to pay the fee back. Oops, that really <laughs> is painful. I remember that from my days on a desk. Exactly. So what we ended up doing is we said, well, let's look at the reasons why the new hires don't work out. And usually it was surrounding personality uh, match where, you know, the manager said, oh, I always have to walk on eggshells because he's so delicate. My gosh, if I say the wrong thing, blah, 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 and I'm not comfortable, I need to be me. Great or point. it's the issue of, you know, everyone works in this office until 8 p.m., but Paul, at 5.01, he's out the door, or vice versa. And it's everyone a, leaves at 5.01, but Paul has to stay till 8, 8 p.m. every night, and his peers are jealous. Those are the kinds of things that I think really do make a difference, and they're a very soft skill in nature. It's usually not the technical skill that causes the fallout. It's usually the fact that it's an incompatible individual with that particular department's culture, and that's really where a good recruiter comes in is they know how to assess and match the candidate's personality with the hiring manager and the hiring department's overall culture, ethos, whatever you want to call it. They know how to make those personality matches happen because they're asking the right questions. So from, say, if somebody isn't going with a recruiter, and that I, I completely concur with you on that point. As a recruiter, it's our job. Most of my clients are very good friends of mine, and I know them. I know the nature of how they work and who they like to hire. And so it is a great advantage if you have a recruiter representing you, because theoretically, that person should know a little bit about the, col uh, the company culture. But on the off chance, somebody is applying directly, and they have no idea if it's the right company culture, and you're not going through a recruiter, so you can't ask ascertain whether or not that person might be, what do you look for as far as are there body language cues that you can tell? Like if you're in one company versus another, I'm sure the different companies you've worked for as well, whether it was Paramount or NBC or wherever you might have worked, those companies are each going to have their own intricacies and uh, subtleties as far as what works and doesn't work for them culturally wise. What would you say, is there any subtleties that you look for aside from just what's actually articulated in the interview that gives you an indicator of whether or not somebody's going to be a cultural match? Yeah, the funny thing is it depends on the hiring department. I have hired okay. for hiring for, for department managers who I'm not going to exaggerate. I'm not going to say, oh, they, they, they spit fire and they throw chairs. That would, that's just to make people laugh. But, you know, some are kind of tough, and some are very down-to-earth, and they're very straightforward, and they don't hold their tongue, and you really do need a thick hide because that person will tear you up if, if, you're, if you're too sensitive. 
I've also hired for managers that are like, they want to love all their employees and they mean this seriously. I mean, they do. They see it as a family. They want someone who's going to come in and the fit is so important to them. There's nothing wrong with either. Um, you will fall on one style or another as a hiring manager, as a, as a leader in the organization. But the idea is this. Let's assume you don't have a recruiter who's helping you match personalities. Then I think one of the things that becomes important is, again, you're going to follow an 80-20 rule. The 80-20 rule should be you're asking questions for 80% of the time and letting the candidate do the talking. Mm. And you shouldn't be talking until the very, very end. Oh. Because once you've assessed the candidate's responses, Jennifer, then at that point, based on the responses, you can share a little bit where it looks like it's a match, and you can you can talk a little bit where it looks like it may be a rub, right? The example you gave before with the attendance issue. Um, if you talk too much going through it, the candidate's just going to sit there and nod their head the whole time, <laughs> and then at the end, you're going to say, this is a great candidate. I love this person. But meanwhile, you didn't really take them through the questions. Yeah. So I think if you remember the 80-20 rule, have your questions lined up in advance. And then what I think you're going to do is you're going to talk Talk to them. Once you get to that point where you've assessed where they stand, you can talk a little bit about, I want to share with you what it's like working around here and what I think people would say about working for me as the hiring manager. Because I want you, full disclosure, I want you to really understand what this is. And in some of the ways, I think this is a wonderful place to work, but like every company, like every family, like every everything, you know, we've got our awards too. So I want to kind of share that with you because I don't want you to come aboard and be shocked or be disappointed or anything else. Or have an unfulfilled Again, expectation. Correct. And again, that's the manager making herself or himself vulnerable, too. It does have to go both ways. If the manager comes across with, give me an example of a time when you did this. Give me an example of a time when you did that. Two hours later, the person's absolutely exhausted. <laughs> and all they've done is give examples of a time, but there's been no humanity injected into the in equation. So I good. think even if you're, if you're the candidate and you're sitting with someone who is very by the book, very arm's length, very hard to read this person's personality, see if you can inject a little bit of your own. See if you can find a way to either make them laugh or just do something. Because, again, I think at their heart, people are they're good people, the hiring managers, just like the rest of us. Whether they're hiring or not, they're still good people. They're not necessarily people people. They're not necessarily comfortable at this game. And the, and the strategy for applicants, in my opinion, has always been, especially when you got the ones who have the very uptight body language, and you, you can tell they'd rather kind of have a root canal than do this. <laughs> You know, you can, you can, I don't want to say tease a little bit, but see if you can find that place to make it a little more humane. If you can add uh, just a little bit more humanity to, to the process, um, that's what makes a difference. That's what I would hire. Now, again, I'm Italian. I'm very warm. <laughs> I'm not everyone's going to hire like me. Right. I, I get it. I don't expect everyone to have the same philosophy. But I do think it really is important that if you're not that comfortable in this process, and you have a candidate that can come in and loosen you up a little bit, very nicely, respectfully, not going beyond a certain point. You know, you don't want to go across the line. Um, it'll just make you feel a little more bonded to them because that helps the hiring managers. And I almost think for the applicant, if you're on the applicant slash candidate side of the equation, see if you can let them see your personality a little bit. That's not going to hurt. A little bit is never going to hurt. But I'm afraid that if the candidate follow suit and this very black and white Q&A, 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 like a ping pong game. They may even get the job, but they're not going to know this person one iota better. And so when they accept the job, they don't really know what they're getting into. That's not good for the applicant either. Yeah, it's, it's important to get to know the hiring manager. And it's a fine line I found. There's three different types of hiring managers that I kind of quantify people into when I'm explaining to a job seeker about somebody's personality. There's what I call warm, warm. A warm, warm person is like you, honestly, Paul. It's somebody who is gregarious and uh, oh, very sure. friendly and just approachable. And you're naturally somebody like you, as you just mentioned, is going to automatically put the candidate at ease. Then there's what I consider warm business which is kind of middle of the road, where they're approachable enough, but like you said, not the full closed off body language where you could carry a conversation, but also still very focused on the business side. And then uh -huh. there's the toughest interviewers, which I call business business. And you know those people, and so do I. And they're just, everything is business, cut to the chase. And I agree with you, because if you get that person to laugh or to warm up with you, 
I think it's going to change the dynamic of the interview and also give you insight as opposed to just being kind of an arm's length, a way of understanding the company or the culture. Getting to know that person whose business business may be a much higher uphill battle than the warm person, but it's going to give you a lot more insight. One of the things I've found uh, that I've coached job seekers on, I would love your two cents on this, Paul, is that when somebody's asked, tell me about yourself, it's this interesting question that job seekers are never quite sure how to respond. Do they respond with their personal life about their kids? Do they talk about their resume? One of the things that I've suggested to job seekers over the years, especially if you're dealing with somebody who's either warm business or business business, look in that person's office for indications of some sort of icebreaker that you might have a common denominator with that person. For example, many years ago, there was the general counsel of a Fortune 500 company I was recruiting for. And when the job seeker went into interview, he noticed that the general counsel had a picture up of his favorite baseball team. And by the end of an hour, even though this guy was more on the business side of things, they had really kind of opened up the conversation and broken the ice and got to know each other more than just on the surface level. How do you you feel about that if say a candidate comes into your office and they notice that you have pictures that your kids have drawn up and they tie in their kids how does that make you feel as a hr executive it's interesting it goes different ways on the one hand what you were saying a minute ago jennifer i would totally agree with you know if you can come in and find something oh he went to ucla oh he was in the ucla marching band oh you know something along those lines right right you're automatically going to have something to talk about that's always a smart strategy there's also the point, though, where most people will go on LinkedIn these days before True. they meet with an interviewer. So they can kind of look and find that. They might be armed with that, and that may be one of the two or three or four questions that they want to ask and tie into their interview process, because asking questions is really critical as well. But Absolutely. again, I think the only other thing I'd say, too, is, again, just remember, it, this is not perfect, and it's never going to be perfect because you're dealing with human beings. <laughs> there will be some people, because you're going to try and insert a little bit of your personality, and you're going to get zero back. Well, good for you for trying, but a just understand effort. that that's just the way they're cut. You know, if they're not going to bite on it, they're not going to bite on it, and that's okay. But I still think that the idea would be, as long as you're comfortable in your skin, your best self will come out. And that's the way you need to interview. Don't overthink the process. Don't say, well, I've read four books on interviewing, and I know <laughs> that when they ask, you know, tell me about yourself, I'm supposed to say blah, blah, blah. The one thing I'll tell you real quick is I usually recommend to employers, don't ask, tell me about yourself. Really? It's not the right way to open a question because candidates may end up sharing stuff with you that's protected information. So true. Um, you know, well, you know, I'm a cancer survivor and. <laughs> and it's like, well, and I well, have five God children. Bless you, but that, that shouldn't be coming out in the first thing in the interview because the employer is not supposed to know that because that's a protected characteristic in California, you know, as an example, and in other states. So I think that when you open up that question, you kind of invite some problems because candidates don't know what to do with it, but the employer's just trying to be nice. What I usually tell employers is say something along the lines of, you know, walk me through your progression in your career, leading me up to what you do now on a day-to-day basis. That's a fine question. Or walk me through your progression in your career leading up to the company that you're now in. In other words, give the, the applicant the chance to kind of walk you through their resume in 30 to 45 seconds. And it's smart because as the employer Sometimes you forget. Sometimes you didn't even have a chance to look at the resume before you sat down with the person. And this way, they can give you a broad overview, but it keeps the focus on business, and that's where it's supposed to be. The business question is what you want. The personal question is what you probably prefer not to know. And, um, you know, that's why I think it's a better way to handle it. All that being said, most employers are still going to open up and say, tell me about yourself. And I think you can keep it nice and short. Practice your little 30-second elevator pitch, pitch yeah. and, and end it in. And that's why I'm so interested in this job today. Yeah, and, that- and, and then you'll be fine. It's, it's a fascinating thing because I've been doing this, you know, maybe since college, right? We were talking about that earlier, <laughs> you know, just for a few like years. Two years ago for yeah, you and I. Two years ago. Uh-huh. We, ju- we both just started in this, <laughs> in this industry. But uh, it's interesting for me because on the recruitment end of things, I never, I kind of let the conversation naturally flow and see where it goes. But I can tell you the few times where I've fallen into the trap on the recruitment or employer side of tell me about yourself. You're right. It does often come up. Well, I'm married with two kids and I have this ethnic background, which is all 
all, oh my gosh, like as an employer, you're like, ah, please don't, yeah, right. <laughs> please don't tell us <laughs> stop, that. Stop, stop. <laughs> let's, let's just push the rewind button on that and go back because a lot of our listeners out there may not realize that for an employer, it's our worst nightmare to find out that stuff because as Paul just mentioned, those are all protected classes, not only in California, but in many other states. So I like the way that you suggested approaching it of, you know, take me through a brief history of your background and one of the jobs when I coach job seekers, that's exactly what I tell them to do and to leave with an example of why someone should want to hire them. I think that's one of the important things my guest a few weeks ago, Allison Garrido, was talking about is giving examples of why someone should want to hire you. Do you think that's beneficial in an interview, Paul? Sure. And, and you'll, you'll find a way to weave that in throughout. So, so exactly. normally what happens, Jennifer, is employers are trained to ask what they call behavioral interview questions or behavior-based inter- questions, interview questions. And what happens on a behavior-based question is you ask a candidate a question and then they give you a response. And then as the employer, you dig a little deeper to kind of get them off text and to get to know them better. So here's an example. Paul, what do you like least about your job? as vice president of human resources. And I would say something like, oh, the hardest part for me is, you know, terminating people. I hate having to do that. And then the interview here says, yeah, I know, me too. That's terrible. Well, tell me about the last time you were in that kind of situation. What happened and what were the circumstances and, and how did the whole thing come about? And now you're off to the races because now you're unscripted. Mm. And now you're talking about something within history that's real and concrete. But at the same time, it gives you a chance to go back and forth. You know, would you do it differently? How did your boss grade you on that? You know, what, what, was, the, what was the learning experience for you as you went through all that? And that's all fine. And I think when you get into that behavioral interview questioning strategy or technique or whatever you want to call it, where most employers will take you, even not very sophisticated employers know at least that they're supposed to do behavior-based interview questions, that's where you can weave in your achievements. That's where you can find ways to weave in your accomplishments. And say, as a matter of fact, in that situation, what happened was blah, 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 blah. And I got nice accolades for that from my boss, actually, because my boss said to me, you know, Paul, good, good thinking on your toes and like the outcome. So you can find ways to weave in those achievements and those accomplishments, just like to me, Jennifer, just like when you're writing a resume yep. or when you're doing a self-evaluation for your upcoming performance review or when you're interviewing. You have to find ways, this is not bragging, this is, this is not judgment, this is just observation. You have to find ways to bring in your achievements and, and your accomplishments. Whether it's what you've done to save time for your company, to increase revenue for your company, for example, salespeople, to save costs for your company, finance, HR, even IT, you know, to develop new systems, whatever. Find ways to talk about that because people want to focus on, I don't want to say they want to focus on winners, that doesn't sound right, but they want to know that you're someone who's thinking about making a difference and what have you done to make a difference. And the difference uh, I can share with you real quickly, when I see a resume, that's what I call a comma resume. Okay. A comma resume reads like a job description. It's the administrative assistant who says, I do phones, comma, filing, <laughs> comma. And it's like Mail, your whole resume comma. is that. And it's like, well, that, but why is the company a better place for your having worked there? That's the theory that you have to bring to your resume writing, but it's also the theory that you have to bring to your in-person interviews. Yeah, it's uh, one of the things we teach job seekers. There are two points, actually. One is what we teach is proactive versus reactive interviewing. And by proactive, what we mean is the same sort of thing. We want to see you block and bridge over to talking points about where you've increased productivity, efficiency, or performance, or what we call PEP. And where I find that's very valuable, it's just like if you watch uh, any of the political candidates right now, they're very keen and good at blocking and bridging over to their political platform. Platforms. Now, it may seem manipulative when I'm teaching a job seeker this, but I know you and I both know this having sat on our side of the desk. It's painful sometimes, like pulling teeth, getting people to share reasons why we should want to hire them. And so if you have three or five uh, pre-planned talking points about your pep of where you've increased productivity, efficiency, or performance, it's really going to make the interviewer's life a lot easier is my experience, right? Totally agree. And you know where I see it the most? 
Where? Interestingly enough, uh, with military. I was with, just with, about with to veteran. ask about your book. Uh, I know you co-wrote a book called Boots to Loafers, Finding Your True New, uh, Your New True North, which I would love to get your insights on that about how do our wonderful, I mean, uh, my grandfather was in the military, and I know so many of us are so grateful for the service that our military men and women provide so that we have a chance to be a free country. So please tell us some of your tricks and tips of what our military professionals can do to get themselves back in the workplace uh, once they get out of the military service? Well, it, it's almost cultural in a lot of ways, Jennifer. When you look at it, um, you know, again, God bless these folks. They have put themselves in harm's way, many of them. They are true heroes. But you won't know it from their resume, I can tell you that, because I, I, you, know, you look at many of these resumes, and they're missing all the achievements and all the accomplishments. Mm. And it's almost like you have to pull it out of them. And <laughs> I, I think culturally, it's a sense of, listen, I'm not going to brag. Ah, yes. but, again, but, but again, my, my separation line has always been the difference between you know, observation versus judgment. Mm. Judgment is very subjective. If you're bragging, that's judgmental. Okay, if you're observing, it's very factual, and I think if you can if you can kind of get your head around that and say, "Listen, I'm a former U.S. Navy SEAL. I'm putting it at the top of my resume. I'm not going to bury it on the bottom of page two, or I'm not just going to leave it off and say I was in the U.S. Navy." Um, this is just an example, but, course, but you know yeah. what I mean. Give yourself every advantage because the truth of the matter is, it is very cool to hire veterans. Most employers like me are looking for reasons to hire veterans. It's the right thing to do. You go to a ball game, we stand up, we sing, we salute. It's just, it is so cool to hire a vet. That's number one. Number two, though, is in California, they put rules in place mm. that said, for example, you know, 7% of your population has to be veteran. Or, and it's also roughly, roughly 7% of your population needs to be disabled. And they're pushing companies to hit those numbers. It's not enough to say that you're doing outreach. They want to see results. So the funny thing is, that's not a bad thing. It's not a good thing. It just is what it is. But understand something. If you can put that forward and, and present yourself in a way that not only makes it easier for companies to hire you, but in the back of your mind, you know, you're helping them meet all the numbers they need, they need to meet. It's a win-win for everybody. So don't be so shy. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong when you're sharing facts. It's one thing if you say, hey, I was the champion, I was the king of the hill, I, I won all the awards. That's, that's bragging. I wouldn't go that route. That's way too subjective. But to list your achievements and your accomplishments, be proud of them. Those are objective. Those are not things that are, that's not braggadocio, and that's not stuff that you're making up. And being objective about that is simply telling the truth. And we have to make sure that our veterans know how to tell the truth about themselves. Marketing and, and, and you know, self-promoting are kind of, discouraged almost from a military yeah, standpoint. I, I, I think so. And, and again, anytime you hear anything self-promoting, they think, oh, that's negative. It's not necessarily negative. Um, it's a matter of being truthful, being transparent, being factual, and letting the rest take care of itself. But what you don't want to do is hide it under a bushel basket, because that doesn't, that doesn't benefit anybody, because the employer doesn't know. It's the same as if you went in and didn't tell them you were in the military for the last four years. Well, they're not going to know. You've got to be, well, they don't have a problem saying that. They're proud of that. Okay, that's fine. Now, what'd you do in the military? Sorry, I don't want to talk about it. Again, I don't say you have to give very detailed information, but I think it is important to talk about what you've done that's made the military a better place for your having been there. Because what you've done to make the military a better place has made our country a better place. That's the spirit of where corporate America is these days. They're all developing programs. They're all trying their best to attract and develop and retain you know, uh, veteran talent. Take advantage of that. That's not an unfair advantage. It's a good thing. So it's all in that same spirit. I agree with you completely. I've been very privileged to get to lead a series of workshops to a friend of mine's charity called Makeovers That Matter here in Los Angeles. And it's an amazing experience to get to stand in front of. It's predominantly women with this charity where you're giving them physical makeovers as well as internal psychological makeovers of helping them understand their worth. Because I think so many of our amazing men and women veterans out there come back feeling defeated because I can't even imagine the psychological 
psychological warfare, what it's like to be out there. I've, I can't even put myself in those shoes. And I think that so often we undervalue ourselves, what, whether you're a veteran or whether you're the uh, just a job seeker who's out there looking for a job. I think it all comes down to owning your self-worth and realizing that you are someone who can contribute. And I've seen it on my side, uh, Paul, a lot, where job seekers will put their military experience at the bottom of a resume. But just as you indicated, a lot of my employers, whether it's to meet uh, numbers or whether it's because they actually just really value it, I found that when I've interviewed people who have come from a military background, they just, they show up, they're punctual, they are reliable and dependable. And it's a, those are all attributes where that they don't realize employers really want. I mean, an employer wants somebody. When we ask reference questions, we ask, is this person reliable? Is this person dependable? Are they a team player? And I think that all of those attributes are reflected in those uh, men and women who have served for our country because they come back. They know how to play and be part of a team. They know how to make uh, independent decisions when necessary. And there's all these attributes that I feel like military personnel don't realize because for them it's like breathing they're like oh well yeah of course i'm going to be a team player oh of course yeah i'm going to be here when i said i would be here and yet you and i as employers you know we don't take that for granted that's an amazing attribute to be able to show up on time be a team player and put forth 110 percent uh like most military people will do and whatever you or i can do to help more veterans get hired i think it's so important and i think it's brilliant that you wrote this book about it yeah, the funny thing is, you know, I don't think anyone doubts that the leadership training you get in the U.S. military is the best in the world. And it, it speaks to everything. It speaks to the honor, the trust, the integrity, the reliability, the dependability, and all those kinds of things. And so, yeah, I totally agree with you there. And again, I, I do think, though, sometimes from what I've seen, Jennifer, the, you know, veterans are hesitant. They feel like it's bragging. And I don't want to ever advise someone to brag. And that's not the message that I'm sending here. I'm not saying go out there and brag. You've got my <laughs> say permission. Say how amazing you are. Well, but, yeah, but, but I do think it's a great idea to be able to say, listen, share what, share what, you've, what you've celebrated in the military uh, without details, because some of those things I understand that are probably not appropriate to share in an interview. Yeah. But at the same time, yeah, you've done a lot of wonderful things. And forget being in the military for a minute. If you were working at another company and, and coming in to interview with my company, I want to hear all the wonderful things you did at your current company. So just if you think about it in that mindset, it probably makes life a little bit easier. I will tell you, though, when you can take someone's resume that looks like, again, what I call a comma resume out of the military and then focus it more on the achievements and the accomplishments, have you noticed? I mean, it's like, wow, what a Total difference. Night there, there, and there's day. so much more color to it and more spirit, more personality. It's like, wow. And if you can wow people, you should. Yeah. Whenever you have a possibility to wow them, go for it. Don't be shy. Yeah, it's when I used to do resume writing for about a year before I opened my uh, recruitment company, I had a career consulting company and people would pay me to write resumes, which quite frankly, I hated <laughs> because I thought it wasn't a it wasn't a fair reflection of people. So I would never write somebody's resume for them. I would actually work with them and help reflect back almost as a mirror to them their own greatness because mm-hmm. I think whether you're a military professional or um, you know, a non-military professional, it doesn't make a difference. We there are a lot of us out there that struggle with our own achievements and with recognizing where we contribute, like the admin example that you gave. I've coached many administrative professionals throughout my career, and they'll say to me kind of ho-hum, well, Jennifer, I don't really make a difference. I just answer phones. But like you mentioned, if you can start your resume or in an interview with an action verb, facilitated, managed, um, you know, I think of my book, Stop Hoping, Start Hunting, I have on page 63, a list of over 100, uh, you know, action verbs that you're using. And then you're following that up with something that you produced or uh, an achievement or an accomplishment, then it completely, as you just said, transforms a resume from just comma, comma, where it hurts an employer's eyes to look at to something that really pops and generates uh, enthusiasm. So whether you're in the military or a civilian person, what it really comes down to is just making 
making sure that you can own your value. And this is across the board, whether you're in an interview situation or in your personal life, I think owning our own value without coming across as bombastic or coming across as overly cocky, it is that fine line where you can come from, I think you said it so well earlier, Paul, where you can come from a place of authentically owning your contributions that you've made in the workplace or otherwise or in the military, and then not making it, hey, look at me, I'm amazing, but yeah, well, you know what? You're right. I did accomplish this. Wow. You know, I did help my team achieve this or that, whether it was professionally or in the military. I think it all ties together of just owning your greatness and not being afraid to put it on paper or to articulate it in an interview. Yeah, totally agree. Couldn't have said it better. Totally agree, Jennifer. (laughs) Well, Paul, I could talk to you all day long, but we're getting close to wrapping up here. And so what I do want to do is I want to make sure that our listeners, if you could repeat the name of your book, I know, I think you had told me it's Boots to Loafers, Finding Your New True North. To recap, that was the military book that you co-wrote about how to get back into the private sector after the military. Is that right? Correct. And you can get that on Amazon. Okay, great. And I know, Paul, you've written, my gosh, 10 different books. I mean, I'm just so grateful to have you on the show right now. I, we've been speaking with Paul Falcon, a senior HR executive and best-selling author of 96 great interview questions to ask before you hire. Uh, Paul, I believe your website is uh, www.paulfalcon, F-A-L-C-O-N-E-H-R.com. Is that right? Exactly. Paul Falcon, HR. Yeah. Dot com. You got it. Yeah, and I think you can keep your eyes out. You have a new book, which is about to come out in June, right? It's entitled... Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about that book while we have a little bit of time left. Oh, that's nice, Jennifer. It's, uh, it's my 10th book with the American Management Association, and um, this one is called 75 Ways for Managers to Hire, Develop, and Keep Great Employees. I like books with numbers. I have 101 books, 96 <laughs> books. Now I've got a 75 book. Um, I like the numbers. I just something that kind of caught on for me. But yeah, this one is, you know, chapter one, again, from the hiring manager's perspective, is really how to interview, how to assess the candidates. It's almost like the 96 great interview questions book, all melded down to one chapter. And then I have pieces of it that talk about, you know, motivation and engagement. And then I have pieces on it that talk about, you know, avoiding what we call litigation landmines, you know, not making mistakes when it comes to harassment, discrimination, and those kinds of things. So the whole idea was more of a life cycle type of book for finding and keeping really, really good employees. So that's the idea. It comes out in June. So thanks for mentioning that. I appreciate it. Oh, of course, Paul. And it's so important for those of you out there listening. uh, One of the biggest concerns right now in the market that we talked about last week is that it's flipped from an employer market to an employee market. So for any of you HR professionals out there who might be listening, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to to pick up Paul's book because we're seeing that top talent are being lost and recruited away right now for higher salaries, better benefits. And I think if you approach it like what Paul just mentioned, and you build a good, strong foundation, and you figure out and implement strategies in order to keep your top talent, you're going to be able to retain your top talent while other people are getting snatched away. So I think it's a very timely book. And I'm so happy to hear that it's coming out in June. And is that going to be available on Amazon? Can people buy it other places, Paul? Yeah, my books are all, you know, Barnes & Noble, um, Amazon, you, wherever. <laughs> Just Google my it. Books. So, yeah, exactly, exactly. Awesome. Well, again, this is Jennifer Hill with Get Yourself the Job. Today we've had Paul Falcon on our show, top international best-selling author on human resources. And next week I'm delighted to say that we have Wendy Sweet, very dear friend of mine, director of human resources of a major Los Angeles law firm. And she'll be on the show next week and we'll be furthering the conversation about some of these interview questions and what employers look for. That is the question, how to hire top talent and how to retain it, just like we discussed today with Paul. So thank you so much for being on the show today, Paul. And I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of your week. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, Paul. You're listening to Get Yourself the Job with Jennifer Hill, only on LA Talk Radio. 